All right. Well, welcome to the Saugus of Douglas History Center's Tuesday Talk program, Strategic Conservation in West Michigan Planning for the Future with Justin Kesslinga. I am Eric Galanik, the director at the History Center, and really thrilled to welcome you all here for our virtual and hybrid uh, socially distanced outdoor programs this uh, 2020 season. The mission of the Saugus of Douglas History Center is to preserve local history and inspire learning to inform and improve our community. A summer tradition since 1996, weekly Tuesday talks present entertaining and informative insights into local community life throughout the months of July and August. Direct your attention to our Facebook page and website for more information about our upcoming programs through the end of the month. Uh, we have a program tomorrow evening on History's Mysteries Online at 7 p.m. And next Tuesday, join us in the same Zoom space for a look back at the 1997 uh, exhibition, Painting the Town, uh, the SCHC's overview of Zogatog Douglas Art History with Kenneth Kotzel. I want to acknowledge our sponsors who have supported us uh, through grants. Uh, the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, supports our programming. Uh, we also have received a grant from Michigan Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the CARES Act. And the Allegan County Community Foundation also supports our work through these grants. Thank you, too, to our supporting members. Uh, if you would like to become a member of the History Center, please join online at history. All right. I'm going to pass the program over at this point to our presenter today. To our presenter today, uh, Justin Kesslinga. Justin is stewardship director at the West Michigan Land Conservatory or, or Conservancy. His background includes working as a botanist and restoration ecologist. Uh, he has also worked on environmental education and community organizing projects. Uh, in rural Tanzania with the U.S. Peace Corps. Justin earned a degree in biology from Calvin College here in West Michigan and a master's degree in natural resources and environment from the University of Michigan. And with that, I'm going to hand the program over to you, Justin. Great. Well, thanks, Eric, for that uh, introduction. And thank you all for uh, joining today. And thanks uh, uh, for the invitation to talk with you um, this morning for a little bit here. I'm excited to share the work, uh, some of the work that we've been involved with. Um, so let me take a moment here to share my screen um, and pull up what I've got. And all right, thumbs up if you can see that. All right, we got a, we got a thumbs up. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Justin. I'm the Stewardship Director at the Land Conservancy of West Michigan. Talk just a, a little bit about what the Land Conservancy is if you're not as familiar with that. Um, and my role at the Land Conservancy, um, stewardship is kind of a, a, a funny word at times, but basically means land management. So I'm on the land management side of things, uh, but also um, am involved uh, somewhat in the land protection side of things as well. So. Um, just real quickly, what I want to uh, chat with you about today, um, just a, a brief agenda here, is uh, talk a little bit about why, uh, why conservation is important. Hopefully that's, that's apparent, but I just want to put this in context, um, uh, and we'll bring some of the history into that as well, as well as how we use that history to inform what we do in the future. And then um, I want to talk about uh, kind of uh, how we move forward into the future and conservation planning. We recently uh, went through about a year and a half process of uh, going through a strategic conservation planning um, uh, process. Uh, and we, we just unveiled our, our new strategic conservation plan. And there's sort of two elements or two ways to, to look at that. And the first is through uh, land protection, right? What lands are we going to protect? We'll talk about what that means um, and, and how the, again, the history informs um, uh, what, what's on the ground and how that informs what we might, might want to do in the future. And then once we've protected those lands, um, what the land management might look like. 
Um, and so hopefully we'll have a little bit of time uh, to, for Q&A at the end as well. So just a, by way of real quick introduction for those of you who aren't as familiar, the Land Conservancy of West Michigan, we've uh, been around for over 40 years. Um, we work to protect and restore uh, natural land here in West Michigan. Um, we are an independent nonprofit accredited through the Land Trust Alliance. Uh, we serve um, parts of eight counties here in West Michigan. I'll, I'll pull up a map uh, here, I think. Uh, and yeah, let's do that now. Um, and our service area uh, runs essentially from Saugatuck, uh, midway through Allegan County here, Saugatuck, north to Ludington, and then one tier of counties inland. And we work with partners on, on either side uh, to, to do larger scale uh, conservation as well. So what, when we talk about land protection, what do we mean? We have uh, three primary tools. Um, uh, the first is, um, uh, nature preserves, uh, which are these green dots, might be a little bit hard to see on your screen, uh, but nature preserves are lands that we own, uh, we manage for ecological purposes as well as for public access. A couple in the Saugatuck area you might be familiar with are Dune Pines and Castle Park uh, preserves, uh, two smaller uh, sites uh, between Saugatuck and Holland. Uh, the second way that we work is through community partnerships, and that's where we use our expertise in land management and land restoration to work with uh, other partners, be it local units of government, uh, be it uh, townships, uh, the state, um, other nonprofits to uh, protect uh, land that ultimately ends up in their hands. So a couple of projects in the Saugatuck area you might be familiar with. Um, Saugatuck Dune State Park was one of our first big projects. Um, of course, that's now held by the DNR, but we were critically involved in that at the beginning, as well as Saugatuck Harbor Natural Area is one of our, our projects in the past. The third way that we protect land is through uh, pr uh, private conservation easements um, or, or conservation agreements. These are legal arrangements between the landowner and us that um, certain development restrictions will stay on that property and that runs with the land. So even after the, the uh, owner sells their property, um, it stays natural forever. And most of those are private and, and do not have public access. Uh, a couple exceptions in the Saugatuck uh, area, uh, well, Heiser Farm Park, which you might be familiar with, we hold an easement on that. Uh, that's in Laketon Township, Township Park, um, as well as Talmadge Woods, you, you may be familiar with that as well in the Saugatuck area. We've protected almost 12,000 acres um, of land and, and have, more, have more to go. So that's just a real brief introduction of, of kind of our work as the Land Conservancy, and I think that'll help give a little bit of context to our discussion today. But um, enough about uh, my organization. Um, let's look back in history, and I want to bring up a map, and this is a map of Allegan County, um, uh, circa 1800, and this is a map of natural communities or, or ecosystems that occurred uh, in Allegan County at that time. Uh, this star here is, is where Saugatuck sits, um, just for, for your frame of res reference. Uh, you need really good uh, eyes to, to notice the color differences between, uh, between all these, um, and mine aren't that good, but I can tell you that this is, what this is showing is an extremely diverse mix of uh, forest types. We have a lot of beech maple forest along the lakeshore, uh, some hardwood and, and white pine forest, uh, this lighter green area. Inland, we have a little bit more oak hickory forest, and then these orange areas and, and kind of light pink or tan areas are a lot of the oak savanna and oak barrens habitats that characterize places like Allegan State Game Area. Green, green and blue areas are wetlands that are interspersed uh, within all of that. So incredibly rich natural environment. Um, uh, really, Allegan County um, sits at uh, an intersection between sort of northern ecosystem types and southern ecosystem types. And so we have both of those represented here, as well as on uh, the lakeshore, uh, we have sort of those, those communities that are really driven by um, the geology of the dunes and, and um, the, the microclimate that the lake provides. And then inland, we get some of those drier habitats. Um, again, those are uh, a lot of the oak barrens and oak savanna. So incredibly rich uh, natural history. If we go to a next map, this is showing approximately the same uh, geography. Again, stars in, in uh, Saugatuck uh, for reference. And this is showing the percentage of habitat loss of those various ecosystem types. The darker the red color, uh, the more of that ecosystem type has been lost. Um, 
And uh, what we learned from this is in, in this region, which is very typical of Southern Michigan, between 90 and 95 of, of, a percent of all the natural habitat has been uh, destroyed um, uh, since that time, since 1800. So if we're thinking about, um, okay, what, what do we do now? What do we do about that? What is our response? Um, kind of the first uh, option, of course, is protect what's left, right? We want to find uh, those remaining five to 10% of lands that are still in relatively good condition um, that haven't been converted to development or agriculture and, and protect those. Uh, of course, we can't do um, all of that. Um, it's very resource in intensive. Uh, that's, that's the work that we do. So we need to make decisions about what, what we do. And that's what a lot of what we'll be talking about today is how we make those decisions. And then once that land is protected, um, then um, we either need to maintain it if it's high quality um, or restore it if it's degraded. So. Um, again, uh, we can't uh, restore um, everything that we protect. Um, again, uh, resources are limiting. Um, so how do we make those decisions and how do we uh, make sure that uh, we're, we're given this a fair shake? And um, I'll emphasize that, you know, this is uh, hopefully, ideally, all done uh, very strategically. It's not just, oh, uh, here's some land over here, let's save it. Oh, there's another piece of land over there, let's plant some trees. Um, we try to be as uh, strategic as possible and let science be, be our guide. And so that's, uh, that's a little bit what we'll be uh, talking about and that'll be, be permeated throughout um, our talk today. So let's start by talking about the land protection elements. Again, this is using those three methods of land protection, uh, uh, purchase or, or outright uh, acquisition, which is our nature preserves, uh, conservation agreements, uh, and community partnerships. Basically three tools in, in our toolbox, and, and that's the case with most conservation organizations to, to protect that land. So again, we want to be strategic about this. Um, and so uh, we recently uh, went through a strategic conservation planning process. And at its core, um, if you're not familiar with strategic conservation planning, which I don't necessarily expect that you are, but at its core, it's a mapping exercise. And so uh, the first step is to identify uh, what is important. What do you want to show? What are the critical elements that make land worth conserving? So this is just a, entirely a schematic example. This is not real data. Uh, but on your left, you might have, uh, you have your input layer. So maybe this is showing something about population density. Maybe this is showing something about a certain species. Maybe this, this bottom one is showing something about, you know, wetlands and, and where they are, for example. And then after you decide on your layers, um, those, those pieces of data that tell you something about what's on the land, um, you decide that those are important. You mash those all together uh, using some uh, fancy software. Uh, and out pops um, a map, uh, an overlay map of those, th those uh, elements squashed together and hopefully that will tell you um, at least something about the conservation value uh, or whatever um, uh, parameter of interest you're, you're looking for in the landscape. So here, again, uh, this is not real data, but maybe the red is, is higher quality, maybe the blue is lower quality or vice versa, I'm not sure. So we sat down, um, again, talking with uh, a number of partners, uh, extensive community input process, a lot of literature review, and came up with four layers. Um, there's, there's three shown here. We came up with four that really embody um, what's most important about um, uh, conservation potential. Uh, and so I'm gonna go through each of those. I'm gonna go through the first three pretty quickly, and then I will spend a little bit more time on the fourth, and I think you'll you'll see why. The first uh, the first layer is uh, proximity and connectivity to existing natural lands. So um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't necessarily want to create uh, new natural areas that are disconnected from everything else, right? We want species and ecosystems to kind of move between these areas. So the first question we asked was, okay, where are the conservation areas already? Whether they're, thing, they're lands that we've protected or our partners have protected here. Uh, 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 Everything in yellow is the state, or, or uh, the, um, this is a lot of the Huron Manistee National Forest, um, as well as uh, many lands that we and our partners have protected in between. And this map in particular works a little bit better if you zoom in um, and right, but at the, the, the level of um, this, our, our service area at this scale, it, it really reflects where those conservation existing 
conservation lands are now and our desire to kind of fill in the holes between some of those government held lands um, as well as expand on, on what we have already protected. The second layer uh, that we thought was critically important has always been a part of what, what uh, we do and what the conservation world is about is, is wetlands and water. And uh, thinking about both from kind of ecological um, perspectives, these are some of the most biodiverse and biologically productive uh, systems that we have, as well as the human component uh, uh, of water quality, right? Um, water quality is, is such a big issue. Um, and we have a lot of great water resources here in West Michigan. Uh, we're blessed with that. We want to keep that that way. So this takes into account both locations of wetlands, uh, water bodies, um, upland buffers around those areas, right? We, we want to make sure that there's some natural habitat uh, in between those areas uh, for, for habitat as much as water quality. And then we also looked at um, at areas of uh, high, high groundwater recharge. And where that comes in, again, is the water quality aspect, but also keeping stable flows in our streams, uh, keeping water in our lakes and rivers. The third layer is, is habitat quality. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of data baked into this, but essentially this is looking at the landscape and seeing where we know that there are uh, rare species, rare ecosystems, or large blocks of habitat that are known to support those uh, features. Um, so you can see certain things standing out here. This is Allegan State Game Area, a lot of the oak savannas, which are globally imperiled uh, ecosystems. Carner Blue Butterfly, which is a, a, a federally endangered species, also inhabits uh, these areas. More of those oak savannas and barrens up here, and then large blocks of uh, interior forest habitat up in the uh, uh, here on Manistee National Forest here uh, really pop out in this map. So up until now, those three layers are pretty conventional. Even if you're not a conservationist, they probably make some, uh, some intuitive sense why we might want to target those areas. The fourth layer I think is more interesting and it re really represents uh, not a departure but a tweak on what we've been doing, a new way of uh, a new lens to look through to, to view con conservation. And that is uh, the lens of landscape resilience. Um, I'll talk a little bit about where this layer uh, comes from in just a second, and I'll bring up this map uh, again later. Uh, but the areas in dark green here are areas that are uh, more resilient, and the uh, areas in brown and gray are the ones that are less resilient. So what do I mean by resilience? So, um, if you look at the site level, uh, site resilience is the ability to, of a site to support biological diversity and ecological function, even as it changes in response to future stressors. And so this is uh, basically just saying, we know that things are not going to stay um, the way they were. They are not the same as the way they were. That first map I showed of that um, glorious diversity of habitats is there no longer. Um, there's stressors like um, habitat fragmentation, invasive species, hydrological alteration, fire suppression in some of these areas. Um, and of course, looking uh, forward and even presently, climate change is sort of the next uh, big stressor that we're looking at. A lot of this resilience work is sort of done through that lens of climate change, but you can apply it to all these other stressors that, were, that are equally as, as um, impactful on the landscape. And so what we're looking for are sites that can um, Content, maintain that biological diversity, all the, the, sweet, uh, the, the, the suite of plants and animals and, and wildlife and bacteria and fungi that are happening there, and then ecological function. If you're not familiar with that term, that basically means that things are happening on the landscape. So plants are regenerating, nutrient cycles um, are, are persisting, the, you know, the water is uh, being filtered and, and uh, putting back into the air through transpiration. Um, uh, all these things that we sort of take for granted that, that happen behind the scenes, um, those are all still happening in these healthy, resilient systems. So then what is a resilient site? Um, those are uh, lands with sufficient variability and microhabitat options to enable those species and ecosystems to persist in the face of, of those stressors. Um, and so this is, uh, I'll, I'll show a slide uh, in just a second um, that shows a little bit more what we mean by that variability in microhabitat. But this is where we depart from sort of that 
a traditional conservation focus of what is on the land uh, right now, those species and ecosystems, and what is on the land that could support species and ecosystems in the future. So making sure there are uh, there is a variability and, and uh, those microhabitat options. So our, let's unpack that a little bit. There's two elements, uh, basic elements that go into landscape resilience. And the first is geological diversity or geodiversity. That just means variability in uh, landform, uh, topography, soils, things that um, uh, you know, we have a pretty good maps of, we know what they were in the past. Those things are relatively static, you know, short of another period of glaciation. They're at least here for the time being. So that's where that history really comes into play is uh, digging back into some of those uh, geological records and, and drilling down onto uh, our natural history, but looking at the ground, not necessarily what's on the ground. So in a, uh, if in a low uh, resilient situation or low geo, uh, geodiversity situation, we might have a flat, a flat landscape, right? Same soil type, no topographic variation. If you can imagine, maybe this is inhabited by some forest type. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, you can imagine the sun uh, might be up here. It's beating down on the landscape. Maybe as things get hotter in the future, um, that habitat becomes unsuitable for whatever species are living there. Um, if, that, if it's a bird, uh, great, maybe it can fly away. Most species aren't that lucky. Um, they can't travel long distances. So there's a, a couple of options that those species have is either move or, or, or die, um, right? And if you can't move, well, your only option is to die. Um, so contrast that with um, a high geodiversity uh, situation. Uh, where you have a lot of topography. And again, it's really important to, to understand this is on a very site uh, level. This is on the order of a, a couple acres or even a backyard that this, this occurs. So if you imagine on, uh, let's, say you're a, um, let's say you're a plant growing on this, let's say it's a south facing slope and it's, it's warmer, uh, it, it, you're getting all that, that solar radiation, um, it's getting hotter, uh, it's becoming unsuitable. All you have to do here move a few feet over onto the cooler side of the slope where you don't get as much of that solar radiation and you're you're happy as a clam right you're literally moving over a few feet you don't have to go a uh, hundred miles to find better habitat similarly um, this works with uh, uh, drier and wetter habitats as well down here you might have a wetland or a lake or something like that as uh, water levels fluctuate right we know about those uh, you know living next to Lake Michigan of course um, water levels go up, um, some of those uh, species and ecosystems uh, that are adapted to that move a little bit upslope. In drier periods, this might, maybe it dries up completely, but you, and then species from up here can migrate down. But you have these areas that are very variable, are quite variable and support uh, many different uh, uh, species and microhabitats on that landscape. The second component of uh, landscape resilience, which is a little bit more intuitive, is connectivity, right? This is just, okay, even if you have that uh, geodiversity, can species move? Um, and if you've got barriers in the way, again, this could be something as big as a city, but also works on the scale of a building or a house um, that could impede the movement of certain uh, 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 species. Again, uh, if you've got uh, no barriers, uh, species can uh, at least move as freely as possible throughout that system. And this all ties into uh, a concept called conserving nature's stage. This is another concept that uh, the Nature Conservancy, which is one of our partners, has, has sort of put forward in thinking about this. And I think it's a really helpful metaphor. And really what it is is a theater metaphor. And if uh, you know, you ever have gone to a play or, or any sort of live performance, uh, there's, there's a stage and there's various actors that are coming, coming and going between acts. Those, those actors might change. The story is playing out. Uh, but something is happening. So what's important is that there's a stage there for that action to happen. And uh, this is a matter of emphasis, right? Um, and so it's, we're not as concerned about what actors are on the stage at any given moment or what actors might be and have gone in the past or coming in the future. And again, those are our species and communities. Uh, but we're more concerned that the, that the uh, physical space is being protected so that a story, whatever that story may be, and that story is ecosystem function, uh, can play out over time. And so, uh, yes, we're still concerned about um, what species are there, but maybe just a little bit less so 
And by focusing on those species, we sometimes forget that the fu what's fundamentally important is the land on which they're occurring. So I'm not making any of this up. This is uh, the result of uh, a decade or more of uh, research that the Nature Conservancy, again, one of our partners has been putting together. They now have this landscape resilience uh, data available for um, all of the Eastern US and they're, they're working to add some Western states as well. If you go to this URL or just uh, search landscape resilience, this mapper will come up. Um, it's, it's super interesting. You can, you can drill down into all this data um, and, and really explore it. Very user friendly if you have an interest in that. Just thought I'd put in a plug. So if we get back to our, our layer of landscape resilience, you can start to see why some of these areas might be brown and gray in here. Um, low connectivity with, with urban uh, development in Grand Rapids and Holland and Muskegon here. You know, if you've driven through central Ottawa County and, and this part of Allegan County, it's, it's flat, it's agricultural. There's really um, not a lot of variation. Whereas you get, you know, east of Grand Rapids here, you get more rolling hills. This is a big uh, uh, glacial moraine system. Um, a lot of little kettle ponds and streams and lakes. And, and again, that rolling topography makes for uh, much more resilient habitat. You can see some of the river corridors uh, to the north uh, popping out as well as being um, important. Again, a lot because of that topography and the variation in soils and, and hydrology. All right, so um, those are our four layers. If we mash them all together, here's what we get. Again, the orange is areas that are protected already. So really from our perspective, those are off the table. We wanna build on those for sure. Um, but uh, if we kind of do an analysis of where those areas are clustered, they fall into three general regions. One being the Lake Michigan shoreline. Uh, hopefully you're all familiar with, with that. You know, these are these dune landscapes. You can see some of these areas down here. Saugatuck Dune State Park, uh, Saugatuck Harbor Natural Area, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this area up that I've already mentioned before in the, the around a lot of the Forest Service land, we're calling that the Big Forest and Wild Rivers. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work up on the uh, Pier Marquette uh, as well as uh, along the Muskegon and White Rivers as well. And if nothing else, um, you know, when we, when we did this analysis, um, we can kind of look around and say, hey, uh, conservationists, us and our partners are kind of working in the right spots. Um, if you look at the areas that the Land Conservancy have protected, over 50% of our lands and 75% of our acreage is in these two, these two regions, the Lake Michigan shoreline, big forests and wild rivers. Uh, what's maybe a little bit uh, uh, interesting or, or new is this uh, area over here in um, Eastern Kent County, which we're calling the Eastern Glacial Corridor. I sort of already uh, tipped my hand there, but if you look back to our resilience map, uh, this, is, uh, this resilience is really what's driving, driving that area. Of course, it does have other um, benefits as well, um, but that's, uh, that's kind of new. And so in our uh, strategic conservation plan, we're really putting an emphasis on uh, doing work in these three areas and looking a little bit more strategically at, at being more proactive in this area as well. If you're interested in, in uh, this work, uh, our strategic conservation plan, if you go to our website, naturenearby.org, you can go in, uh, explore all this data. There's some interactive features. You can read more about our process and, and what we're thinking about moving forward. But from a land protection perspective, uh, this kind of gives us a framework to think about where we are going to prioritize work and where we're going to uh, kind of take a, a more passive, passive approach. Then I want to move uh, to uh, the land management uh, side here for, for uh, the next little uh, few minutes and, and talk about um, how that same sort of line of thinking and, and using uh, that uh, historical data and information to inform, uh, you know, what we know about the land and then using uh, that to sort of propel our work forward, how that uh, ties into the land management work uh, as well. And I'm going to go through just a few examples of uh, how we've been working on the landscape and uh, our management options kind of fall into one of three categories. Of course, it's a continuum. Uh, but on the, the left-hand side here, you have this idea of resistance. So here we're resisting change. Um, and this is, uh, we're trying to, uh, you know, this is kind of preservation, that kind of uh, 
idea that what is there now is is what we want that's that's good that's the best option and we're going to try to keep it that way that's um, absolutely an appropriate um, uh, response i would argue at least for things like uh, rare species uh, you know threatened endangered species rare natural communities um, if nothing else to buy us time uh, to until we move it into um, some kind of other state on the other side um, uh, off to the right here is this idea of transition and so that's where we're going in and we're saying well what's here now is probably not going to persist in the face of all these stressors again you know our, the pressures being put on by you know forest pests and invasive species and climate change and habitat fragmentation so we need to take action now to ensure that the areas that we've protected will continue to support ecosystem function in the future and so this is where we might be doing some more active planting uh, of uh, species that are uh, certainly local, uh, but also looking a little further south, thinking about that climate change aspect and thinking about uh, what might we want to plant that is going to um, survive here in 200 or 300 years. If you plant an oak tree, that's the time frame that you're looking on. And many of our forests um, are really kind of a lesson in history. If you look at the canopy species, um, many of our, our forests here in southern Michigan are oak dominated on the canopy. So those oaks started um, as seedlings two or 300 years ago. They grew up into the canopy. Uh, there's almost no oak regeneration uh, in many of these forests because of things like fire suppression and invasive species. What's coming up are things like red maple, which is a native but, but very aggressive species, as well as a lot of the exotic invasives. And so we really have a forest that doesn't have much of a future. And so are there ways that we can transition that, not necessarily to go back uh, to what it was before, but transition it to the future. And in the middle, you have this idea of resilience. This is a little bit um, different usage of the term than, than that landscape resilience, but it gets at the same idea where we set this uh, land up to um, change on its own, to, be, to give it the, 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 the chance, get those, to, it needs to uh, persist into the future, whatever changes those may be. And so as I'm kind of going through these uh, a few examples here, maybe just think about um, uh, for yourself, uh, does, do these examples fit more on the side of uh, resistance, more on the side of transition, or do they fall somewhere, somewhere in between? And the first uh, kind of uh, uh, thing I want to highlight is, um, you know, uh, using history as a guide, uh, not necessarily a prescription. You know, I, I've been doing this for uh, 20 years or so in, in one uh, form or another. And, you know, back, back in the day, even when I was starting out, it was always, let's restore these places to historical conditions. And again, that may be very uh, valid in those uh, resistance or persistence types of uh, models. But what we're learning now is that's virtually impossible. It's really not achievable in most scenarios. Uh, again, with all these stressors, uh, our idea of restoring these areas back to what they were in, you know, the 17, 18 hundreds pre-settlement conditions is, is really not uh, realistic and not necessarily desirable because those systems may not be the ones that persist in the future. But those uh, historical conditions are still really important to know about and to understand. Um, because it, it tells you something about what's possible on that site. It tells you something about the soils. It tells you something about what, what types of species uh, may be able to persist there, even it's not, if it's not the exact same set of species as was there in the past. So we, re we still rely on these historical vegetation maps, uh, which by the way, um, if you're interested in, in this uh, kind of history aspect, definitely check out uh, Michigan Natural Features Inventory. That's where all this data comes from. Um, you can go down uh, some serious historical rabbit holes looking at how this data was compiled, um, reading all about uh, historical accounts of these natural communities. It is, it is very fascinating. So just how that might play out on the ground. Um, on the left here, this is uh, one of our nature preserves in Kent County, uh, the Weggy, uh, Weggy Natural Area. This is one of those uh, forests I was mentioning just a moment ago where you have oak in the overstory and all this, this is uh, all red maple coming up in the understory. You can see virtually no, uh, no regeneration of anything happening on the ground. So pretty low diversity, uh, very low ecosystem function. Um, this, is, this is how many of our forests here in Southern Michigan look. 
um, and this is an ailing, ailing forest. And so, uh, you know, if we were operating, you know, 10 years ago, I might have said, well, this was historically oak savanna. Let's, let's restore it to oak savanna. Um, and that might be perfectly, perfectly reasonable. Um, what we chose to do instead was say, well, we know that oak savannas probably won't persist in their exact form uh, into the future. So rather than focusing on that, let's focus on biodiversity and ecosystem function. And what we ended up with is just a slightly tweaked version of what we were going to do anyway. Um, but we ended up with an extremely uh, diverse landscape. So we took out most of the red maple, we even thinned out some of the oak, which are desirable. And within two years, uh, we had just a, what, what is now one of the most biodiverse forest understories, uh, frankly, that I've seen uh, here in Southern Michigan. We did uh, some planting, but we weren't so concerned about historical fidelity in our planting mix. It's all still native species, all still site appropriate, uh, but we're also getting forest uh, understory species that had been shade suppressed for many, many years. And so as we, uh, just two years into this project, um, it's, been, it's been a marvelous success uh, and we're thrilled at the results, even if um, a purist might uh, uh, go out there and say, well, this isn't quite an oak savanna. They'd be right about that, but um, I guess we don't care. Another way to sort of uh, think about that or, or frame that is uh, to say that we're embracing novel ecosystems. All right, so here we're planting a site. Uh, this is also, I believe in, yes, this is in Kent County, uh, a prairie area that we're restoring. We've got some uh, little wetland features. Uh, and again, rather than trying to restore to a, um, a pristine historical condition, really playing around with our seed mixes and what this ends up being, I'm not really sure. Uh, we'll wait to see uh, how it develops over the next several years. So what is a novel ecosystem? Um, so if you uh, believe the Society for Ecological Restoration, this is their definition. Um, a novel ecosystem is a site that because of deliberate or unintentional human activity has composition, structure, or function with no natural analog. All right, so if this was, uh, you know, usually when I do a presentation like this and it's live, this gets to be a little bit more interactive, but you'll just have to think for yourself here. I'm gonna show a few examples of, um, of systems and you can, you can decide whether they're novel or not. Um, so the first one here, uh, this is in clearly in somebody's front yard. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, looks like a, a mix of native and, and possibly non-native species, a lot of great, um, a lot of great pollinator habitat. Looks like it's in a little bit of uh, a swale here, so probably some uh, water quality components. So a lot of ecosystem function here. Of course, it's in this setting of, of sanitized turf grass and, and some ornamental plantings here. So uh, I would hope that you would say, yeah, this is a novel ecosystem. Um, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's actually pro probably, you know, it has aesthetic uh, um, value as well as, as some ecological value. So there's nothing wrong with novel ecosystems, but this is, this is definitely a novel ecosystem. Uh, let's move to another example. This is a wetland um, on the, uh, it's a coastal marsh on Lake Erie uh, down in southeast Michigan. This is a stand of invasive Phragmites. Um, so Phragmites is this tall, tall grass, gets 12 feet tall, basically obliterates everything. It's a monoculture of Phragmites. Um, you know, if you go back to that definition, it doesn't, uh, it, uh, it doesn't need to be intentional, intentional or unintentional. This was certainly an unintentional human activity um, it caused, uh, brought in by humans, also exacerbated by uh, high nutrients and, and, and things of that nature. Um, you can see some novel geology down here too with this limestone riprap, that's, that's, that's not natural. So even though this looks a lot different than the first example, I would certainly argue that this is, this is also a novel ecosystem. Um, how about this one here? This is uh, a photo from a Glacier National Park. Um, I didn't take this one, unfortunately. A beautiful scene, uh, pristine in many ways. Um, Glacier National Park, um, yeah, it, it is a, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. Um, so you could probably say, well, this is, this is certainly the most pristine of all those examples. But if you know a little bit about the history of, of this area, and, and of course, glaciers receding in general, 
a lot of these areas um, are now exposed, exposed bedrock um, of uh, areas that were under ice for many, many years. And uh, what's popping up in those areas is our, our uh, species and combinations of species that we've never seen at those altitudes. Over here, you've got some uh, areas of permafrost uh, or, or, or mostly frozen ground that are slumping uh, down because of the thawing. And you have these areas of exposed soil, again, that are um, uh, species that are disturbance prone and more found at lower elevations are starting to colonize those areas. So uh, you could make the argument that um, you know, this is certainly uh, a novel ecosystem as well, even though it's maybe not quite as novel as, as some of those, uh, those other two examples. Uh, in fact, there's a kind of a growing movement within the scientific community that almost all ecosystems um, on the planet um, now, because of climate change, are becoming or will become novel ecosystems. So um, novel ecosystems really are, are the new normal. That's the, that's the environment in which we're working. And so it's, again, it's not that we want to scrap the idea of historical conditions and, and preserving that, uh, but we need to uh, acknowledge that those things might not persist in the future. And are there, uh, can we work within that framework of novel ecosystems to still bring about uh, biological diversity, habitat quality, and ecosystem function. So just a couple other examples of things that we are uh, doing out on the landscape uh, to get at this idea of, of resilience and ecosystem function. Uh, this is a site in Grand Rapids. Um, this is a little bit of an unconventional project for us. Uh, we partnered with Blandford Nature Center to uh, purchase a, a defunct golf course that was next to their property, uh, Blandford's property, and we are working uh, to uh, restore it to uh, natural, uh, natural habitat and urban green space. Um, and so here what we're doing is uh, uh, installing some wetlands. When it was a golf course, this whole site was drained and tiled. So there were, there were drains going under the entire thing. Um, and so we are finding where those are, pulling those up, putting water back on the landscape. Uh, where it belongs. And it's interesting that where, when we start digging in some of these areas where, we, um, uh, where those drains are, we're, we're reaching down below the surface and, and getting into some uh, thick black muck. And so um, we know that there were wetlands here historically, which is really satisfying to see. And this is all work that we were uh, going to do anyway. But now that we have this understanding of what resilient landscapes look like, we're really using this as an opportunity to uh, further promote that topographic variability. So here we're making a little berm for the water to back up. Um, and uh, whereas we would have done that anyway, we're just making it a little bit higher and we're putting more variation into those landforms that we're, we're creating. So again, it's not a, a 180 degree uh, turn from what we're doing. It's just a matter of, uh, of emphasis. This is what that site looks like um, uh, uh, two years later. Um, so you can see it's now mostly filled in with water. And what's neat uh, about this, if you know your, your plants, um, we've got a lot of wetland species down here uh, by the water's edge, obviously. Up here, we've got xeric species, or, or those, those driest of the dry species, mostly things that we've planted, some volunteer things that have come in as well. Uh, but this, these water levels fluctuate uh, throughout the season and from year to year. And so as this dries up, um, species from you know, the top of the hill can come down and colonize these areas. Uh, in, in wetter years, as uh, the water raises, the, that wetland area expands, expands out. And so you have these uh, species with different life histories and different habitat requirements living in very close proximity to each other that can easily shift and, and slosh across the landscape. And then uh, the last thing I want to touch on is this sort of uh, lens of resilience um, and looking to the future uh, offers us uh, the ability to think creatively, uh, creatively about uh, some of the complex uh, problems that, that we face as land managers. So this is a, a, a photo taken from Flower Creek Dunes Nature Preserve. Uh, which is on uh, the shore of Lake Michigan up in the Muskegon area, uh, similar to, to many of the habitats in the Saugatuck Douglas area, these back dunes, these uh, steep back dunes dominated by um, oak and, and maple and beech and, and historically ash, hemlock, 
rock. Um, these are kind of the classic uh, dune forests uh, that, that hopefully we've all had a chance to walk through and appreciate. Um, but uh, all is not necessarily well uh, in these areas. Uh, all the ash, uh, of course, uh, has died from the emerald ash borer that swept through uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, this, is a, this is a dead ash here that's about to fall over. Most of those have fallen over. Uh, the beach, uh, the American beach that we have is uh, uh, probably about 90% dead um, and the rest is on its way out from beach bark disease, uh, which is a fungal pathogen uh, that's making its way up uh, the lakeshore uh, especially. Uh, red oak, um, it forms a significant component of this canopy and uh, oak wilt, which is another fungal pathogen, is not on this particular site yet, uh, but we're dealing with oak wilt sites all around uh, on our properties and our partners are as well. It's a lethal, lethal disease that creates these big uh, 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 pockets of oak death within a forest. And then um, hemlock forms uh, a, a huge component of these forests as well, especially on the cooler north facing slopes. Hemlock woolly adelgid is, a, uh, is an insect pest uh, that has uh, unfortunately established itself here in West Michigan, starting in the Holland area and sort of moving northward along the lakeshore. Um, and there's a significant regional and statewide concern and, and a concerted effort to contain that, uh, but it is uh, almost 100% lethal to uh, hemlocks and uh, will do, uh, without, without action, um, will do similar damage to the hemlocks, what emerald ash borer did to ash and beech did to beech bark disease. And so I, I throw this slide up there not to depress you, although maybe that's an appropriate response. Um, but our forests uh, are, are in trouble, right? So what does is, what is resilience look like on this landscape, right? And this is an area, and I, sh I should note, that has tremendous topography. This is a, in one of those uh, high resilience areas. Um, so it has this stage. The stage is set. This is a protected area, um, and it, is, uh, it's, it has a lot of microhabitat. So what do we do here? And I'm not going to answer that question necessarily. Um, but whereas in the past, um, we would have, well, I'm still freaking out about it, but we would have freaked out even more about losing these iconic canopy species to say, well, it's, it's no longer a, a dry music northern forest, which is the, the forest type this, that this is. Um, and uh, this resilience lens has sort of allowed us as land managers to, um, I wouldn't say relax about it, but um, uh, take a longer view and say, okay, let's assume that most of these trees are not going to be survivors long into the future. Okay, what is our what does our management look like from there? Um, is it uh, it's it's perfectly possible that we do nothing. Uh, we let this uh, we sort of set up. Uh, I mentioned before this is set up as a resilient landscape. Uh, we let it uh, change autonomously into the future. We let whatever comes in come come in, and that may may certainly be good enough. Uh, there's also talk about taking more of a transition approach and say, can we come in here and can we do some underplantings of uh, trees that uh, will do well in this environment, will do well in this environment in 200, 300 years. And so we're looking a little bit south of here. What, are, what do the dune forests look like um, even south of Allegan County and the Berrien and Van Buren County? Um, things like tulip poplar and black gum and cottonwood form uh, a, a good part of those forests down there. Those are native species. Um, we're not bringing anything crazy, but can we, can we maybe come in and do some underplanting so that when these canopy trees die off, those can come in and they're, they're ready to take over. And so those are so, the sort of questions that we're thinking about and wrestling with uh, right now. Um, but I think that resilience does sort of offer us a, a, a hopeful framework to think about some of these things. Um, and with that, I will, um, I will stop here and, and thank you for listening to me ramble for a little bit. And I guess we'll uh, open it up for some questions. And I understand that um, maybe I should have said this before, but feel free to type in questions. Uh, hopefully Eric's uh, got a couple of queued up here. Yeah, thanks, Justin. That was that was really interesting. Yeah, uh, you're, those of you on the call are muted. If you would like to ask a question or if you have some comments or feedback, please, uh, we'll try this out. We've got a small enough group if you want to 
uh, ask a question of, of Justin, please do so. If you would like to type a question in the chat or comments in the chat, I can also moderate those and read those. All right, looks like there's a question from Pat. What's the forecast for our maple trees? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, it depends on what species of maple for sure. Um, uh, sugar maple is probably gonna end up being a winner in some of these scenarios. Uh, we'll see an expansion of that further northward. In our area, it probably won't change that much, but it will likely expand uh, into Northern Michigan. If you look at red maple, which I did mention as sort of a semi-pesky native uh, species. There's some conflicting research on that um, as far as uh, kind of its future resilience. Uh, some models have it going up, some have it going down. Um, it depends on what factors you take into it. If you look at purely a climate uh, uh, a component, it's probably you know a loser. But if you factor in everything else that's happening on the landscape, so those other stressors I mentioned, uh, things like fire suppression, it does really well in the absence of fire. It does not, it does not like fire. So things like that will probably um, help it increase. And so uh, just anecdotally um, and from my own understanding, red maple in particular is probably not gonna change a whole lot. Uh, Paul says, uh, wait, I just lost it. Uh, with a 100 to 300 year view, how do you plan without knowing pests in the future? Man, that's a great question. And I sure wish, uh, I sure wish we knew, um, you know, that is something of, of concern and my, um, my takeaway. And I think that of, of most people that are in land management is focusing on that diversity, um, and diversifying our forests as much as possible. Um, uh, and you know, when Emerald Ash Borer came through, we kind of learned the hard way with street trees, you know, streets that were planted completely with ash, you know, totally got bombed, of course. But if you have, you know, an ash that's mixed in with the, you know, maple and oak and sassafras and hickory, well, maybe losing an ash isn't the end of the world on your street. Same, same principle holds for ecosystems. So that's why we're, um, I would say we're probably more focused on biodiversity now than we ever were in the past. Um, we're just a little less concerned about what exactly those, those species are. And we still need to be careful about what we're bringing in, which is why we're not, um, we're not proposing to bring in something from China to diversify our forests. We're looking pretty close by and looking at what's, you know, especially with climate change immediately south of us. Um, but when we're doing tree plantings uh, in particular, um, we filter it through that forest pest lens pretty heavily. So we're not doing a lot of red oak planting. Um, uh, because of oak wilt. Uh, we're not planting some of those things that we know are susceptible or we know that there's pests say out east that are um, attacking uh, let's say maple for example. So um, I wish we had a better picture of what's ahead but diversity is is the best we can do at this point. And how small a piece of land is too small to be of interest. So um, you know, it really depends uh, on who you're talking to. Our organization, we don't have a hard, uh, a hard acreage limit on, on what we'll consider protecting. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, I, a rule of thumb though is, um, you know, we're usually not doing a whole lot below, you know, 20 acres or so. Um, it, it depends, we have done projects and that it has to have some pretty, pretty special components or, or be locationally critical. Um, for us to, to um, be able to take something like that on. No, those, those are some great insights. I, I was wondering, I had in my thoughts here, uh, two things. One, you mentioned the, the Michigan Natural Features Inventory. What's the best way to explore that for people who are uh, curious to learn more about the history, ecological history? Yeah, so if you just Google Michigan Natural Features Inventory, or MNFI for short, that's the best way. I have a long URL, it's part of Michigan State Extension. I can pull it up right now. Yeah, mnfi.anr.msu.edu. Um, there's a way to send out that link, um, that's fine. But you can, you can peruse all of those um, 
uh, county by county map or historical ecosystem maps. Um, and then you can, it'll take you to links of descriptions of those natural communities. And those descriptions are really fantastic. And they get into a lot of the history and management considerations and how those developed over time. Um, and those, those maps are really fascinating too. The more you dig into them, the, uh, how they were developed, this is a total aside here, but if we have a minute or two, um, so back in the early 1800s, when um, the whole state was being platted out for development and being divvied up into townships and sections, um, all the surveyors would go out and when they found a um, when they found a corner that they wanted to identify as the corner of a, a section uh, or a township, they would triangulate between the three nearest trees and they would take this they would identify the species of those trees, take the the DBH or the diameter at breast height, the size of the tree, basically. And then um, they would triangulate that uh, point from those trees. And in addition to that, they'd also note some other vegetation notes and things of that nature. And so all across the state, we have an extremely detailed record of at least the trees and a lot of times other vegetation that was present in those areas at that time. And so um, it was a, a decades long process that MNFI led uh, with some other researchers to overlay that with uh, knowledge of where things currently are and uh, soils data and geological data to come up with those uh, historical ecosystems maps. But you can still go, I think they're still, um, those are publicly available, all the surveyors notes for those of you who are history buffs, which, which you might be, you can actually go in and look at those survey notes from any location uh, virtually within the state. So you can look at what, you know, around your house was uh, of in the, you know, from the 1820s to 1840s. Yeah, that's a great idea for a uh, for future program or uh, a research article for our newsletter. Uh, question, who's overseeing the southern half of Allegan County? That is the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy. So yeah, pretty, pretty close name. Um, we do very, we're very similar in scope and scale. We work with them a lot on, on, on projects. Uh, they're, they're good folks too. So if you have property that you're interested in protecting in the Southern half, our line is it's sort of a handshake agreement, but it's essentially at, at M89 there. Um, and, then, and then we take the Northern half and they take the, the Southern half and they go all the way to the, the Indiana border, but good folks for sure. Uh, what, one other question here. Uh, uh, how, if, if people are interested in supporting your work, uh, the work of the Land Conservancy, what are some ways they can do that? Yeah, so you can, um, you can head over to, to our website, uh, check us out, see what we're up to. Um, of course, we, we rely on a, a diverse a stream of funding for our big projects, uh, are funded through uh, grants uh, from both kind of state and federal uh, levels as well as local foundations. But we also rely especially on operations for uh, donation, uh, private donations as well. So um, we have uh, multiple ways to, to give uh, if you pop on over to our website, either online or, or via check. I would also encourage you um, to check out volunteer opportunities. Those are sort of muted at the moment because of uh, the COVID situation. Um, uh, but we are doing some um, outdoor, uh, social, socially distanced uh, volunteer work days that occur on the second Saturday of every month. And those rotate, the, the location rotates to our different properties based on what we have going on. Um, in the future, there will be more um, opportunities to get involved too, but we're gonna let the COVID thing blow over until we resume those. That's great, Justin, thank you so much. Uh, I I don't see any other questions in the chat. Is there anyone who had a comment to share or, or final question for Justin today?